and the goal is for every one of the Bible talks to be fruitful. Woo! Every month. And that is going to take a safe goal. Amen? Amen. Let's be turning our Bibles to Jeremiah 29. Okay. Come on, bro. In this campaign that we're turning to, I'm calling the campaign, it's the title of our lesson today as well, the title of the campaign is Two by Two. Amen. Enjoying very much fruit together. And yet, there's some things that we have to have on straight if we are to bear fruit for God. In Jeremiah 29, 11, God says to you and I, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope. Everybody needs more hope. Plans to give you a future. Ooh. It's an interesting thing. God says, well, I know about the plans I have for you. And they're, they're awesome. Yeah. So when you're not fired up, it's because you don't realize the plans God has for you. Yeah. Ooh. Ooh. And, but how do we get in tune with the plan? How, how do we understand what God's doing in our life and, and what He's formulating in our hearts so that we can be in tune with that plan so that we can see just how awesome it is. Because yeah. for certain we know that God's plan is going to be better for us than our own plan, right? Yeah. That's how we all landed here, right? Yeah. 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 Well, he says, and it continues on right here in verse 12. He says, then you will call upon me and come and pray to me. And I will listen. Certainly the topic of our prayer life is the most major factor in being in tune with God's plan for us. Yeah, true. And isn't it interesting? God's, God's fired up about the plans He has for us, but we're not always fired up about it. Right. We sometimes can even fall into getting angry with God. Yeah. See, I think that at different points and times in each of our lives, we get angry. Because God doesn't disclose the whole plan up front to us. You know what I'm saying? And how do I know this to be true? Well, you learn it in leadership. When the leader makes a plan and doesn't disclose the full plan and when the plan is happening and how we're going to go about it and every detail of the plan, people get ticked off. You know what I'm saying? And that's how I know we do that with God. Because we do that with people as well. We get angry at our leaders. Because they don't disclose the full plan when we want to know all the information. And, and then, but yet God has a phenomenal plan. It's a divine plan. That only those who participate in the divine nature can understand. And when God only unveils part of the plan, right? We don't realize that He trains us for the plan. So He lets us have hardships. He lets people hurt us. He lets things happen that we don't really like to teach us to overcome them and to be better at the end than we start when the hardship came. But yet when we don't understand, we get overwhelmed, don't we? And in those times of being overwhelmed, Depending on what, else, what, what all has happened in our life growing up or major events in our life, we sit confused. Maybe afraid. Most of us don't want to admit when we're afraid. But we like to say we were angry. Ooh, amen, bro. See, God's plan requires faith. God's plans require the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, yeah. self-control. Yeah. And in the midst of God trying to give us this hope and this future, we can lose sight that it requires personal spiritual growth yeah. Yeah. to get there. Okay. We can get focused on what position a man gives us or doesn't give us and get angry or feel fired up without realizing the position God has in store for us. We fail to see the great friends God has put in our lives. The perfect spouse that you have. 
And it gets quiet because because everybody's going, my spouse is not perfect. And you're, and you're right, your spouse is not. But they're perfect for you. That's why God gave them to you. Come on, But then, alas, as we're all in the middle of God's plan, we just want to do it our own way sometimes. You know what I'm saying? And so, when we get to that place where we want to do it our way instead of the way the Bible calls us to do it, we're literally fighting God's plan for our lives. And you know, it's a terrible thing to fight God. Because you can't win. So you fight and you fight and you fight and you do your own way again and again and again and then at the end of that you're very weary and tired because you can't beat God. I mean, all he's really got to do is just kind of go, and we're tired. God forbid he puts his hand on us, you know. He can just like, and we're toast. I mean, Jacob wrestled him all night. The Bible says he just touched his hip and he was done. What if he had, what if he had slapped his hip? Yeah. Yet all this fighting God is so wearisome. And so Jesus had a plan for that. Turn your Bible to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. In Matthew 11, uh, we begin our first point. <laughs> See, the life of following Jesus, being his disciple, is a coming and a going constantly in our lives. Coming to God and then going out where he sends us. And right here is the coming part. God says to us in so many ways, come, enjoy letting it all out. Just get it all out. You know when you're really sick and you vomit and you just feel better afterwards? Yes. The world says sometimes you just need a good cry. Yep. And yet, they're not wrong about all those things. But there's a Bible way to say those things. In Matthew 11, verse 28, Jesus says to you and me, come to me. You know those words are so simple. Right, when we were growing up, mom or dad would be like, come here. And, and yet, God is not always like that. He's like, come on. Come to me. Okay, another hardship. Come on. Okay, another one. Come on. You want, you want to learn the hard way. Okay. Come on. Yeah. And, and he, do you know that God desires for you and I? To speak to him before we speak to anyone on this planet? He desires to be close to you. See, he desires for you to come close to him. He doesn't want to make you. He wants you to desire that yourself. So he says, come to me, all you who are weary. You know, the only way you can be weary is to not be doing things God's way. He says, come to me, all you who are wearied and burdened. Wow. And I will give you rest. You know, it just escapes us so often. We just say it. How you doing? Uh, I'm just really tired. I'm just really tired. And, and yet, God says, well, come to me and you'll get rest. So, if Coming to God gives you rest. How can we be tired? Only if we're not coming to Him. Of course, if you stay up all night, you're going to be physically tired. But that's not what this is talking about. We're talking about being tired in your soul. I'm just done. I can't do it anymore. I'm so tired of all this stuff happening. And God's up there saying, if you would just learn the lesson I'm trying to teach you, then it wouldn't be so tiresome. You'd be fired up. Because you know what I'm doing with you. And you get up more than my life. Then he kind of uses an oxymoron here. Something that doesn't sound like it should produce what it produces. He says, take my yoke upon you. That doesn't sound fun. What am I, cattle? 
Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your soul. Wow. It says, for my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. Do you know how burdensome carrying your hurts are? Woo! Yeah, yeah. Wow, it's burdensome. Man, Man it's tired. So do you remember when you became a disciple? Yeah. And you did the light and darkness study? Oh, yeah. Sin? Oh, yeah. And in that moment, you finally talked about like every sin you could ever remember. You did. And everybody says the same thing after the study. I feel like the weight of the world has been lifted off my shoulders. And then a year in, all of a sudden, it's like that weight's right back. And yet, we don't remember what we learned in the foundational study of sin. Yeah, come on, bro. To be going to God. And to be repenting of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And to be taking ownership of it. Because we lost the humbleness in our heart that Jesus has. He says, learn from me how to be humble to God. Learn from me how to keep your gentleness about you so people actually do want to be around you. Amen. He says it's real easy. My yoke, it's easy. What's the yoke? Obeying the scriptures. There's nothing so deep in the Bible that you can't understand it. It's not a rule book, but if you break the command, then you get the consequence. Which is burdens and fears <laughs> and tires. And so he says, just obey it. My yoke's easy. And then the burden of your life will be light. And you begin to enjoy the life again. You know, sadly, as I think about it, I hear a lot of great things. You know, as the leader of the church, as the leader of the region here, my role is to handle all the difficult cases. So I hear a lot of tough things every day. I hear about the worst of things that happen every day. I get all the bad news, right? I don't really get all of it because some of it stays hidden for a while. But my job is bad news and fixing it. Turning bad news into good news. But yet, I also hear lots of great news every day. People go, oh my gosh, God did this incredible thing in my life. I can't believe it. It's a miracle. It's awesome. I hear all kinds of good news. But you know what I don't hear enough of? I don't hear enough of my prayer today changed my life. My time with God today was so phenomenal. i got to tell everybody about it. I just don't hear a whole lot of that. So that's why we're having a lesson. Come on, bro. See, we can use learning from Jesus in this area. How he responded to God's training for God's plan for his life. See, God's plan for him was to pour himself out to thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people. And for them to all turn on. For them to all betray him. And for him to die. The most horrible thing. So how did he stay on track with that plan? This is the question. He was gentle. And he was humble in heart. And he learned the lessons God gave him. And he prayed until his heart was at peace. Isn't it what we teach one another in discipleship? Pray until you're ready to obey. Right? And, and then somewhere along the line, we just stop doing that. Because right? we're tired of the burden. I don't want to learn this lesson then you won't have the hope in the future at the end. Because you can't claim the reward while discarding the past. Yesterday, it was, a, it was pretty awesome. Uh, Noelle and I uh, went out on the beach for a prayer time. And, uh, and we went out over to Redondo Beach and we walked around. There's the big wall that separates the wharf from the ocean. And there's like a little walkway that's about that wide. And you can walk along the rocks and the jetty all the way around. And we walked out to the ocean. And we just had a good time of prayer again. It was awesome. And uh, and yet, after we left, I went, yeah, we, we, we prayed about all the things that we were talking about we needed to pray about. But you know what? They weren't very loud. They weren't very fervent. 
<laughs> and you know, I think I think if I calculate it up, we probably talk to each other more than we talk to God. I really didn't lead the way in that time of prayer. See, it's so easy to spend time together and not pray about the things we need to pray about. We talk about all the things we need to pray about, then we don't pray about it. How did God, how did Jesus himself stay on track with the plan that ended with him dying? He prayed and prayed fervently for God to save him. The cool thing is that God did save him three days later. Turn to Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5. Of course, the Bible says in Mark 1.35 that Jesus got up very early in the morning. And yet I love what the writer of Hebrews teaches us here. About praying like Jesus prayed. Hebrews 5 and verse 7. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions. Well, check this out how he prayed. With loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard. And why does the Bible say he was heard there? Because of his reverent submission. He was gentle and humble in heart. Wow. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. Isn't that awful? You know, it's interesting. He displayed for us when every fiber of our being does not want to obey how to handle it in the Garden of Gethsemane. Yeah. yeah, true. To be willing to set aside the time to go pray and pray and pray until you're ready to go up and stand these hardships. To stand in the face of them. Strong. Still gentle. Ready for God's plan. See, God gives us situations that are difficult to be obedient in. That where we feel like we're suffering so that we can learn how to obey the tough things. And when we learn how to obey the tough things, then we're on track with God's plan for our life. Now we can be a light to others. It says here, and once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. And he was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. You know, Jesus is the source of salvation. He remains that today. And yet if we want others to have that salvation, then we've got to go through very similar things. So that we can learn to be obedient at peace. So that we can actually hold people by the hand and bring them to the source of salvation. It's an amazing thing. Some of the subtleties of the scriptures uh, I marvel at. Just particular words. The Bible just says, you know, during the days of Jesus' life, this is what he did. Yeah. <laughs> just kind of get the sense that it wasn't a one-time thing. Wow. You kind of get the sense that this was a regular thing for Jesus. And yet I believe that today, we as a people need to commit that in our life, it can be said about us, right? During the days of Rico and Janelle's life, they offered up petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save them from them, right? They can say, during the days of James and Jennifer's life, they offered up petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save you. Let me say about your life today. Sheep. We always go back to 
had the same garbage. Woo! Woo! <laughs> Woo! Amen. And yet, we have this little scripture in the Bible that says, Be perfect just as your Father is perfect. See, because we don't pray like this, we don't believe that can happen. Yeah, the blood of Jesus washes away your sins, so God views you as perfect, even though you're not. And that's hard to understand for a And yet, there's a sin in your life today. Just like there's sin in my life. None of us are any better than that. No one sin is worse than the other. Even though we want to make them worse than others. But that sin that's in your life, can be eliminated. Come on, bro. There are certain areas in your life where you can be perfect in walking like Jesus. Amen. You don't ever have to slap anybody ever again in your life. Amen. You can be perfect in that, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you don't ever have to go through the hundreds of sins necessary to commit sexual immorality. It doesn't just happen. <laughs> There's a lot that happens before that comes about. Yeah. You know, what happened? Well, it just kind of happened. Because we're so numb to all these other sins that we're leading on up to. It, it seemed like it just happened, and the same got you when you think it just happened. And yet, what is he addressing here? Well, I think it's addressing a matter of maturity. See, you don't view yourself enough day after day like God wants you to. There's 8 billion people in this world. And yet, of all those 8 billion people, you're the one you pick first. You think about it. Oh, we understand it in sports. The first people to get picked are the best ones. And yet, God picks us first out of the world and, and we don't view ourselves as special. He views us. You are made in the image of the Almighty God. Yeah. Which means you are made to feel things deeply. Amen. You are made to feel things very deeply. See, when God felt very deeply about how the world was treating His Son when they killed Him, the earth shook. The rocks split. See, God's feelings literally shook the earth. He was in so much pain. I think we don't realize that God can be in pain that you can't even fathom over the sins that He sees conducted. And yet you're made in His image. Your feelings shake things up too, right? They shake up your friendships. They shake up your families. Sometimes they shake up your job or, and you shake up your ministry that you're when you're feeling deep. The Bible says in Luke 5, 16 that Jesus often withdrew to quiet and lonely places. You know, why would he go out to a lonely place? A lonely place is like way far away from everybody. Because he was praying with loud cries and tears. Yeah. It doesn't help anybody if you're standing in the middle of a crowd and you're, God, save me! And so, Jesus' plan for his own life was to go out to those quiet and lonely places where he could just enjoy letting it all out. Yeah. Yeah. Getting everything off his chest. We enjoy, we feel good when we let it all out. Right? Sometimes we get in situations and we feel just so much pressure and Oh, just, ah! <laughs> on people. We let it all out. And just, whew, that felt good. It felt good for you. Everybody else is like, ah! <laughs> what is the way you want to hang out with me? Because uh -oh. <laughs> you let it all out. <laughs> yeah. If you're that type, you just kind of lets it all out. And eventually, people don't want to hear all that. Yeah. Come on. But we forget. 
It's not about people and how much they can take or not take. The Bible calls us to cast all our anxieties on Him because He cares for us. In 1 Peter. You're made in the image of God, but you're not meant to take anxiety from another. Some of us love to hear all the drama. So we just take it. We let people cast their anxieties on us. Not even realizing I can't handle what's happening to me right now. You're not made to take that. See, you're made to do that with God. Not to one another. See, Jesus knew something that I think we should learn today. Come on, it does, bro. The apostles were pretty awesome people, right? Yeah. People talk about the apostles just as much as they talk about Jesus a couple thousand years later. They were pretty awesome dudes. But you know what Jesus knew? I love these guys, so I'm going to say, hey guys, come and sit with me while I pray when I have this loud crying tear. But he knew that these twelve couldn't save him. He knew who could save him. <laughs> he knew that there's no man on the planet that can take anxieties being cast on them. As awesome as the apostles were, the Bible says they were overcome with sorrow during that prayer. Because they're not made to have the anxieties cast on them. You ever got to the place where you're just like, I ain't feeling it. I ain't feeling this, man. Oh, man. I don't know if I want to do this anymore. I don't know. I don't think I'll go today. Well, you never feel like it when you're faking it with God. That's the truth. See, people that take that route are in that place because they're not being real with God. Have with loud cries and tears. There's no way to go to God with loud cries and tears and pray until you're at peace and then be like, ah, I don't know about this. They just, there's no way. There's no way. Come on, bro. Because here's the thing. You will cast your anxieties. Eventually, they will come out. Eventually, they will come out. They'll either come out with God or they'll come out on those around them. And those around you would be crushed if it's consistently them instead of God. See, there's no way to be in tune with God's plan for your life when you're not casting the anxieties in the right place. There's a few truths to this. And everyone who does not cast their anxieties in the right place also doesn't share their faith. See, we talk about sharing our faith, right? And, and we think it's for somebody. It's actually for you. It's actually for you to stay faithful. You need to share your faith to stay faithful. Come on, bro. You'll actually forget about every good thing that God does for you when you if you don't share your faith. That's true. And so everyone who does not cast their anxieties on God with loud cries and tears just invites people to church at periodically. See, really the center of sharing your faith is where you share about the awesome relationship with God that you have. That's the core of what you're sharing when you share your faith. Church is just where you found out how to do that. See what I mean? But those who are not crying out with loud cries and tears, if they share, it's just, oh, my church is this, we have that, church is so cool, and nothing about your relationship with God. Come on. And Satan wants you to think that's sharing your faith. Wow. Come on, bro. Everyone who does not cast their anxieties on God has a life that's full of drama. Yeah. Yeah. And you can't get out of it until you cast it in the right place. Jesus wants you to come to him. See, back in Hebrews, we pick up where we left off here. 
They say, you know, this whole crying out with loud cries and tears. They say, we have much to say about this. But it's hard to explain because you're slow to learn. Right. You just won't go out and do it. In fact, though by now you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's Word all over again. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. That at any point in time in your life, you can get to a place with God that you need to be taught the elementary teachings all over again. That's called being restored. Right? And, you know, we can through discipling times where we're teaching each other, be restored to the Lord in deep times. Or we can walk away from the church and come back and have to go through restoration and be restored. It's all really our choice. It's interesting that as you watch people drift and drift, they go, Why do I, what, what do you mean I need to be restored? You need to be restored. But look at you. Of course you need to be restored. You lost your gentleness. You lost your humility. No one can correct you. You're not under God's authority anymore. Of course you need to be restored. This is good, bro. Isn't it crazy? You can be 15, 20, 30 years in the Lord and get to the point where you need milk and not solid food. See, we teach the principle of quiet times, right? And yet, we're really not supposed to be that quiet. When you get up down to it, you know? We're really not supposed to be quiet. They're supposed to be loud. They're supposed to be crazy. They're supposed to be ah! letting it all out. See, it's not a quiet time, it's a loud cries and tears time. That's what will change your life. That's what will help you see God's plan. That's when you learn to be able to So as we enter this, as we enter this campaign of two by two, enjoying very much fruit together, I have a challenge for you. My challenge to you is at least two times throughout the week, go have your loud cry into your time and get it all out. Amen, bro. Jesus says, come and enjoy letting it all out. Amen? Amen. Secondly, on, let's go to Luke chapter 10. Come on, bro. Luke chapter 10. Secondly, Jesus says to us, go enjoy bearing fruit together, changing the city. In Luke chapter 10, verse 1, after the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them out two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. Isn't that interesting? Jesus didn't go with them. He said, okay. There's 72 of you. Okay, you are with you. You two, go. No, I'll catch up later. You two are together. Go. Cool. Yeah, it's interesting. We, we want to be in control of who the two are. You know what I mean? Ooh. And yet, we always pick wrong for ourselves. Because we want to go for who we like more than who will tell us the truth. And Jesus was like, no, no, no. You need to be with him. Trust me. Go. Yeah, you two, definitely. No. You two, no. Spread apart. Okay, you're with him, you with him. Go that, you go that way and you go that way. He did not. He, he, he just went through and sent them all out. And he said, yeah, guys, have a good time. Love you. No, I've already talked to you. You're good. It's interesting. He told them, see, he says about to every place he was about to go. So he sent them to different cities, two by two. He says he told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, right, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, he says. I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. In other words, it's going to be dangerous. It's not going to be easy. It's not always going to be fun. You're going to be under attack. He goes, now here's how I want you to go out. We also don't like all the parameters he gives, right? Because he just says, he doesn't say forgive your way, he says forgive my way. 
But we want it to be our way, right? But right here he says, okay, I'm going to send you out. All these particular towns, I'm going to go to all of them. So I'm going to send you ahead of me because I want you to converse with people before I get there. I want you to tell them about me before I get there. So he sends them out and he says, but I, I got a few ground rules for how we're going to do this. He says, the way I'm going to send you out is like this. Do not take a purse. That was for the women. <laughs> Or a bag. So that means do not take a bag. That was for the guys. Right? Amen. That was also for the girls because they had a purse and a bag. Bro. <laughs> <laughs> he says, don't take a bag. Don't take a purse. Oh, and by the way, no sandals. No sandals. And, and we know... And do not greet anyone on the road, because I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves, so don't greet anybody on the road, because that's dangerous. But don't wear any sandals, so you, can, you have to stand and face them. You're not going to have to be able to run away from them. They'll have shoes, not you. Kind of sounds like when he weeded the 10,000 down to 300, right? Yeah. He says, so, and I'm sure they were just like, huh? Go. <laughs> Weather! Go. <laughs> You that way, you that way. I forgot where I was supposed to go. Oh, no, you didn't. Go that way. You know exactly where See, They were just like us, right? And, and yet, isn't it interesting? He said no money. Being sent out by Jesus, you didn't take any money with you. You didn't have a bag. Why? Because then you'd go find some money and carry it with you. <laughs> and then sandals. Why? So you couldn't run away from people. You had to let God save you. You had to have a loud cry and tear. Right there. In other words, He made them trust God in the way they went out. See, we could learn a few things from Jesus who's gentle and humble in heart. Then He says, Okay, now you're going to be out there, and I'm going to I'm giving you instruction on what to do when you go to the first house you're going to go to, because they get door knocking, right? It says, when you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. Now, if a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on it. In other words, they're open. <laughs> if not, it'll return to you. So we feel rejection, and then we feel bad. Your peace is actually supposed to return to you. See, when you reach out to someone and they reject you, your peace is supposed to come back to you. Why? So you can take it to the next person. And he says, stay in that house. Of eating and drinking, whatever they give you. You know what some of their prayers were. God, help the food to be good when I get there. Please, God. And there's some loud cries and tears over that, I'm sure. But he says, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. I just find this so intriguing. See, because in the 21st century, the world has changed the church into a benevolent organization. The church is supposed to do the soup kitchens. The church is supposed to put people up in housing. Then how did we get that from what we're just reading right here? Come on, bro. Because it looks to me, like in the scriptures, that the non-Christians were actually housing the Christians. Come on. And feeding the Christians. And providing everything they needed. And yet, isn't it interesting, with all the watering down doctrine over the thousands of years, that everything's kind of flipped around. Where the world's taking from the church, instead of providing for it. Come on, bro. See, you have to, there's a key thing here though. You have to have peace to give peace to someone. And the only way you're going to have peace is to be praying to God with loud cries and tears until you understand His plan. And then He said, okay, first house you get to, that where the person's open, I don't care what they're like, I don't care who they are, I don't care if they feed you nasty food, don't move from house to house. It was funny, a staff meeting, I, I, I preached these scriptures from a different perspective. And uh, and we did the staff meeting, and we had food every time at the staff meeting. 
And the brother that did the food, brought, he got a bunch of McDonald's biscuits and muffins. And I was like, man, I hate McDonald's. And then I realized I'm about to preach about not caring about what people give you to eat. What in the world? We, we can just so quickly lose the convictions we yeah. have in the scriptures if we don't stay close to God. Yeah, yeah. Come on. He says in verse 8, when you enter a town and are, and are welcomed, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God is near you. But when you enter a town where you're not welcome, I don't know about you, but that's what happens more often than not to me. When you're not welcome, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that sticks to your feet, we wipe off against you. Wow. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God is near. Since I tell you, it'll be more bearable on the day of Sodom for that town. <laughs> Jesus had a pretty awesome plan for reaching the world. Find a man of peace. I, I do think that we need to start qualifying, if you will, who we spend our time reaching out to and studying with. Yes. We can so often try and play God's role of making people open. Yeah. You're actually just supposed to keep sharing until you find the one God already opened up. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Study the <laughs> but you're not just supposed to baptize somebody. You're supposed to add a family member. Yeah. 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 You're not going for a baptism. You're going for a disciple who will die faithful in the end. We've got to start studying with open people instead of trying to make people open. I remember when I was in D.C., we added, a, we, we added some family members that would just always be so special to me. We had two sisters who had gotten baptized outside of our church. One of the sisters named Ruth had got baptized in Hilo, Hawaii. Then she reached out to her sister who lived in Boston. And her other sister, her sister Naomi, got baptized in Boston. So you got Ruth and Naomi. Why, why did they have those names? Because they came from a very religious family. And they both came to D.C. for Christmas break. And, uh, and they got there. Now their father was a professor at Gallaudet University, the largest deaf college in D.C. It's the Nigerian family. And uh, Nigerians have a different culture than we have. And, um, and so they came home, and their father had orchestrated these incredible grants for his daughters to be in school. Well, you know, he didn't get the paperwork in in time, and the grant got removed for each of them, so they ended up having to stay in school and couldn't go back for school. But then it came time to go to church when they, after they arrived, and their parents weren't down with them coming to church. They're like, I think you're in a cult. You are not going to that church. Well, you know, some people go, well, Dad, you know, I'm 22, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go to church. The Nigerian culture doesn't exactly work like that when you're the daughter. See, in the Nigerian culture, even if you're just married, right, if you're not obeying your husband, the father may come over and put his 20, 30-year-old daughter over his knee and spank her for not obeying her husband. Say, so you obey your husband, push her back in the house. It doesn't matter how old you are. <laughs> So, you can imagine when dad was not only saying, no, you can't go to church, and he was really angry about it, that the girls were terrified. They stuck out and went to a Bible talk and didn't tell him, and that didn't go well. Now, he didn't spank them, but he was very angry. It was not fun around their house. So, both the girls called me one night, and they're crying. They're distraught. Our family won't let us come to church. And, and at first, I didn't really understand the Nigerian culture as much, so I was like, are you kidding me? Just go. And I didn't understand what those consequences would have been. Like, you don't understand? And I was like, all right, I guess I don't. And uh, I said, okay, here's what we're going to do. Let's pray. We're going to pray right now, and then I'm going to come to your home, and we're going to convert you. That's what we're going to do. And they're like, good luck. So we set up a dinner time. And the Gutangs had us over for dinner, right? And so it was interesting. There was this enormous table and this 
was all lined up with food, and we sat down, and, and the mom was there, and the father was there, and, and, and the kids were all in the kitchen. And they were fixing the food, and they were serving us. And then they went and took their own food and ate on their own. And I was like, no, they can be with us. No, they always do that. They always they serve, and they, they need to learn how to run a home. And so this this family was like, oh, this is awesome. And, uh, and of course, they played like they were going downstairs and sat at the top of the stairs listening, you know. But we had dinner with the Gutenks. And uh, their, uh, their, their first question, the so wife said, I have two questions. And I was like, okay. She says, well, if we don't give our full tithe because we're living beyond our means, does, is God going to be okay with that? Or do we just need to have faith and give our full tithe? I was like, wow, I've never had a, I've never had someone ask me that as the first question after I meet. <laughs> and so I said, you know, tithing is a New Testament thing. The concept of tithe. But yet Jesus says if we don't surpass the righteousness of the Pharisees, then we won't make it into the kingdom. And, he, and what's the first thing the Pharisees would do when they would boast about their righteousness? They go, I get ten times, I, I get ten percent of everything I have. This person would come out of their house. And then they'd go on and on about their prayers and stuff. I go, so I get the sense that tithing is part of that. That we should give ten percent. And, and yet, they gave ten percent and then they gave it all the festivals as well. So they ended up giving like thirty some percent of their So, I said, I think the New Testament's about the heart. That's why there's no specific command about time. There's a command to be sacrificial. So we should give to the point that we feel it as a sacrifice. And uh, and I said, if we know we're not doing that, yeah, I think we're going to have consequences in our life. And I, and I read where the Bible says that it puts you under a curse if you don't give. Uh, and, uh, and, she go, and she she goes, okay, I love that answer. Thank you. She turned to her husband. She goes, see, I told you so. We need to give the whole time. <laughs> and then, you know, she had another question about whether the church was a cult or not. Whether we were going to tell their daughters to disobey them. And I said, no, we're going to teach your daughters to honor you more than they've ever honored you. And uh, hopefully you wouldn't want them to obey you before they obey God. But they're going to honor you more than they've ever done. So they started studying the Bible and they did one study a week. And, uh, and and so we got, it's interesting, we got to, we did the Seeking God study, and that was great. And we did the Word, we got the discipleship, and I said, are you a disciple of Jesus? Is this the way you live on a day-to-day -day basis? And the Father says, no, it's not. Well, you're not living as a disciple. And we know that Christians are disciples. They're the same thing. Could you be saved? And he goes, no, I'm not saved. And I say, I go to church every week, and I'm not saved. Man was so humble to the word of God. Yeah. And he wasn't urgent because it was just one study a week. And, and then we got to the kingdom study and you know, so you know, how are you feeling about things? You know? He's like, Yeah, I just want to be right with God. He goes, okay. You know, we went to ask the kingdom study, we get to light and darkness, and we go, Okay, you read the first scripture, there's light, there's darkness, there's nothing in between. So where would you say you're at? He goes, Oh, I'm in the light. <laughs> He, I said, yeah, you said you're not saved. He goes, yeah, I'm not saved, but I'm in the light because I'm trying. Mm, I got you. Okay. Let's go through a timeline. Because salvation is when you go from darkness to light. You said you were saved here, right? Yeah. You said, oh, I'm not saved anymore. Yeah. Then you said you were saved again, right? And then not again. And he looked at the timeline and he goes, I'm not saved. How many more hours do I need to study to be right with God? We study the Bible. We have never gone to their home where they didn't like keep us there half the day and feed us. Their family. It wasn't just a baptism. They're our friends, they're our family. Of course. And of course, a few weeks later his wife is baptized, and a month after that, their 12-year-old son was baptized. The entire family got united in Christ. When we went back to visit DC, it was just like old times. We went over to the Gutenks house and they had a massive meal for us and, and we caught up on two years of misfriendship. 
Uh, I'd like you to pull out the handout that you have. Come on, bro. Because I tell you that story because I know it's God's plan for your life for you to have stories like that. And I know it's the goal of our church that every Bible talk is fruitful every month. And I believe we can do that. I don't know about you. But I think God has the power to bless our Bible talks where each one is fruitful every month. And yet that's all part of this plan. For those of you who are visiting, the, the special missions that we collected today is under, it's, it's done under this plan, the Crown of Thorns Project. See, it's a plan to plant 12 pillar churches around the world that, once planted, begin to send out mission teams from that city to all the nations of the surrounding countries. And then the, those nations' capitals will send out all of the mission teams for their own country. It's a brilliant plan. And yet it's done based on Acts 1-8. That you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you'll be my witness in, in Jerusalem and in all Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And certainly this plan gets us to the ends of the earth. What makes this particular special mission so special is, if you see all the cities, they're all in green. Meaning we planted all those churches. And this year we plant Hong Kong. So this particular special mission is not only the 10 year anniversary of our church, it's where we plant the last crown of Thor's church, and that brings us into our plan in the United States, the Operation Eagle. And Operation Eagle is to get a church, first of all, in every state. And for those first churches planted in each of those states to plant all the rest of the cities in that state. And so that's why we get so fired up about raising missions and about doing that. Because we're envisioning more families like the Gutangs being converted. And, and of course, each one of our families lives in one of these cities that we're going to. Because we're getting to every city in the world. But we've got to enjoy changing our city together. You know, it's interesting. In the Old Testament, when you read Exodus, you come to find the Israelites went out and they went through the Red Sea, but they didn't go empty-handed. God made the Egyptians favorably disposed, and they gave the Israelites everything they needed for their journey. Then we just read the apostles got everything they needed from the people they converted. They actually lived with those people they converted. And yet, go to 3 John. 3 John. There's only one chapter, so it's 3 John, verse 5. I want us to see the dynamic of how the disciples lived. In 3 John, verses 5 through 8, it says, Dear friend, you are faithful in what you are doing for the brothers even though they are strangers to you. See, many of these mission teams that we're sending out, they're our brothers, but they are kind of strangers to us. We never met them. He says, they have told the church about your love. You would do well to send them on a way in a manner worthy of God. That's why we get the goal every year. Come on. It would not be worthy of God that we send out people without what they need. And yet, it's interesting what he says. We ought therefore to show hospitality to such men so that we may work the truth together. He says, Oh man, I lost my voice. Yep. Yeah. It was for the name, it, yeah, verse 7, it says, It was for the sake of the name they went out. Check out how they went out, receiving no help from the pagans. Isn't that interesting? That all throughout the Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament, the world provides for the church. And in that moment, the world hadn't provided and they noted it for us. Now tell me we shouldn't be out tech. Tell me we shouldn't be out getting from those of the world what we need. Do you know what actually, it helps my heart, because the Bible says that the harvest is plentiful, right? And yet, what a great heart. Yesterday, as I drove up to where we were tagging, I, I had my video camera on. I had my phone on the dash and I was videotaping it. And I posted a video of what people who give, what it's like for them. And so I drove right along the path where everyone was tagging. 
And as I pull up, you see, you see the first one you see was Montserrat. Okay, Montserrat standing there holding the sign, talking about giving. And you drive right on by her, and then there's all the people you're supposed to give to, right? And, and, and it just it blows my mind. The goodness in the hearts of every person who gave to us. The harvest is plentiful. There are people that see signs planting churches, world missions, that absolutely will not just give a dollar, not just give five dollars. We collected over thirty thousand dollars raising missions. Our communities are filled. We want the word of God. We are open to it. We are ready for you to find it and study it. And all sixteen of our Bible talks should be out every day, finding those people. I can't wait till the day that we find one of those people that gave and they get up here and say. Turn on over to the same chapter, Luke 10, in verse 17. Luke chapter 10, verse 17. I just want to persuade you to love changing our city and bearing fruit together. In verse 17, he says, The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to your name. Isn't that awesome? Don't you want that for your life? All the demons that make life hard for you, see them submit to you? That's awesome. But Jesus replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning. He goes, you guys are awesome. He goes, you guys saw demons? I saw Satan himself fall from his head. Remember, Jesus sent him out, right? And then he didn't, he didn't go with them. So while demons were submitting to them, he was seeing Satan fall from them. He says, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. That's why he sent them out vulnerable. So they would have faith in God when they came back perfectly fine. He said, however, do not rejoice that the Spirit submit to you. See, do not rejoice that Tierra is now saved. Don't rejoice that the demons that were driving her submitted. Yeah. Rejoice that your name's written in heaven. Yeah. That way you can share about your relationship with God. <laughs> rejoice that your name is written in heaven. Go to Acts chapter 4. A couple of really quick scriptures here. Acts chapter 4. Acts 4, verse 23. On their release, John and Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had to say to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. And you spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord. Against his entire See, when they had victory, they prayed. They recognized the power of God that just worked. Go to Acts 14. Verse 27. You get the sense that whether things were going very successfully or whether they were hard, they loved it. They did it together. And they prayed together. Acts 14, verse 27. On arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them and how He had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. See, they reported all that happened. They kept each other encouraged with the good news of what was happening. Come on, bro. In Acts 15, verse 4. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders to whom they reported everything God has done. We gotta stop holding in all that God's doing and share it with each other and encourage one another. That's what we should be posting on Facebook. In Romans chapter one. Amen. In Romans chapter one, verse eight. Romanos, that's it. Romanos. Romanos. 
He says, first I thank my God through Christ Jesus for all of you because your faith is being reported all over the world. Let me tell you what, every special missions we collect is just shot heard around the world. Come on, bro. That wasn't a one-time thing like in America, shot heard around the world. Yeah. We get the shot heard around the world every time somebody gets baptized. Come on. We get the shot heard around the world every time God does something powerful in our lives. But just like we hold our repressed emotions in, we can hold in all the good things that God's doing us well. We've got to let it all out in our loud times. I want to challenge you in regards to bearing fruit. You know, being in charge of the cyber ministry, we build some, we build things for people electronically, and we built this app called the First Principles app. And I think all of us should be very comfortable doing the Bible studies. And if you're not today, I want to challenge you to get this app out every morning. And go through the studies again and again and again, listening to them being taught. Come on. You don't get yourself comfortable because you have the way to do it right in your hands. Yeah. Be an expert in these Bible studies. They're what changed your life. Don't you think you owe it to the person that you meet to be ready for them? Yeah. Come on. It's their turn to find life. Go to John chapter 15. You've got to stay close to God. In doing so. John chapter 15 and verse 3. He says, You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Now remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself, it must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. <coughs> he says, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Right? If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. It's a promise of God. And he says, <coughs> Sorry. But apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he's like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish. And it will be given. See, why is that true? Because when you're close to God, you want what God wants. So He makes sure He blesses you with it when He asks. He says, this is to my Father's glory. Right? That you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Every person you baptize that is not your family will fall away. <laughs> They're just a conversion to you, then they will fall away because you do not love them the way Jesus loves them. Unless somebody else interjects into their life and saves them. And so I want to challenge you. Remain in God with loud cries and tears. It's interesting that we can misread this one really easily. He says, if you don't remain in Him, you're like a branch. He doesn't say you are the branch. You're like a branch that withers. And, and you know, when you get to that place where you're not remaining in God, you come in and you look withered. You look tired and weary. But isn't it interesting? When we look like that is when we're not gentle and humble in heart. Because at that moment, we're failing to learn from Jesus. And we have no hope for God's plan in those moments. We've lost the sight of the future that He has for us. But we need to remain in Him so that we can enjoy bearing much fruit together, changing our city. Amen? Amen. Lastly, go enjoy the relationships I have for you. Come on, bro. God has blessed us with many relationships, right? And you need all of them. <coughs> See, you think you don't need some of them. You think some people are just on your nerves. You think some people are just out to get you. You think some people just don't care about you. And, and, and yet, God says you need all of those people. If you're going to reach my plan, you need every one of them. Stop running from my lessons so I don't have to give you a tougher lesson. 
In Acts chapter 2, verse 42. This is awesome. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And I have a confession to make in this point. Acts 2, verse 42. The Bible says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, right? To the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe. And many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. See, we read this scripture all the time. And yet, I think we miss one key point. It says, all the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Sounds like special. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. And how did they eat together? With glad and sincere hearts. Praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. I just get the sense that they really enjoyed being together. But they didn't just party. Right? They didn't just party. Now, what else did they always do together? Well, go one page back really quick to Acts 1. Verse 14. It says they all joined together constantly in prayer. I bet you that there was never a time that Jesus' disciples were together and in prayer. After he died, maybe before, because they all fell away, they had to be restored. Then, I don't think they ever had a time where they didn't pray together after that. <laughs> and yet, I come to find... Many have these points in times in their walk where they don't enjoy the fellowship. Wow. And I think because there's so many that fail to pray with loud cries and tears that many are not fun to be around. And, and, and yet, God's let it be that way to teach us the lesson. I, I do think I'm sold out to discipling teaching, admonishing, correcting, training. Yet, we need to be committed to enjoying one another's company as well. You know, I was, uh, I was talking with one of our leaders. And here's my confession part, right? Talking with him, and he goes, well, Ron, your problem is you don't like fun. You like work. And most people don't like work, they like fun. And I was like, I, yeah, you're right. <laughs> I, I do. I love working. And, and I, in fact, growing up, all the way to the time I got baptized, I never once went to a party. In high school, I never went to any parties. What do you think I was doing? Working. We had our own family business, so I was always working. So I never experienced that going to a party and the drinking and the girls. And I, I, didn't, I never did all that. Didn't, my first party was in the kingdom of God. And they partied hard. And they, they had everything but alcohol and sex and drugs. They had all the wholesome fear. And yet, I desperately need all of you in my life. Because Southland is where people know how to party. focus on correction and admonishment and teaching. But it's also partially because we're not gentle and humble, so we're not changing, so we keep getting corrected. Yeah. So let's, let's have the loud cries and tears. So we're ready to change, so we don't have to have so much correction and admonishment. And let's get down and party the way shout and we got to enjoy it. In this new campaign, we're going to have a lot of fun, man. Yeah. But then, there's not just our friendships. There's also our marriages. Let's go to Ecclesiastes.
And I want to talk to the married brothers and sisters as well. In Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verses 9 through 10. Enjoy life with your wife. Doesn't sound too hard, right? You were fired up the day you got married, right? He says, enjoy life with your wife, whom you love, all the days of this meaningless life that God has given you under the sun. He says, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. We're in the grave where you're going. There's neither working nor planting nor knowledge or wisdom. You know, Marriage. We're actually supposed to be enjoying life with one another. And yet, I hear so much about not enjoying life together. It's pretty funny. I, 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 all I see all day long on Facebook is, Anna, what a great husband I have. My husband's so awesome. I love my husband. Yeah, I, I just don't see enough of that from our marriage. We've got to step it up, Mary. God pulled you out of the struggle of being single. Right? I told you I was struggling with being single, so what's the problem? Right? The problem is, you don't have loud cries and tears to God together. You don't have your quiet times together, and you're not praying together. So you can only go so long like that, where you just don't enjoy being together anymore. You can't be prideful in your times with God and then have a great marriage. Ooh. And so marriage, it's time to get it on straight. See, you got upset because you found out, like a brother recently posted, marriage is not the mess. Come on, right? You thought it was all good in the hood when you got married. <laughs> then you have to go sleep on the wood. Skip the next part. May you ever be captivated by your life. But then he says, Why be captivated, my son, by an adulteress? You know, why look on the internet? Why, why struggle with impurity when you're married? Why embrace the bosom of another man's wife? You know who another man's wife is? Any woman that's not yours. <laughs> you know, Tracy and I are not spring chickens anymore. We're like fall chickens or something. But you know what? In July, we'll have... We'll have our 20th anniversary. <laughs> Only by the grace of God. There ain't no way we would have stayed married in the world. No we would have been done the first month if we weren't in the kingdom. Tracy left me three times in the first year. She walked in. I'm out of here. I'm packing my bags. I'm leaving. I was too prideful to say that. I was too prideful to say I felt that way. And yet, you know, here we find ourselves, me approaching 50, Tracy past 50. <laughs> You know, we're enjoying our marriage. 
really are. We have our two old people chairs in our house. Yeah. <laughs> but it wasn't always that way, even in the kingdom. See, you think marriage is medicine, but then you think marriage is just going to be awesome because you're in the kingdom. And you take two sinners, boom, put them both in the same, in close proximity to one another, like on the same bed, and what are you going to get? Sin? <laughs> Actually, more sin than there was when you were apart. Right? You see every sin? Everything. And then, you, I, you're in the bed together, you face the opposite way of each other. You're supposed to come together, then you end up apart. Right on the same bed. Come on, bro. You know, uh, we love giving nicknames to friends of ours. And we come up with the craziest nickname and stuff. Well, Tracy and I got a nickname. You know, Kim discipled me for six years. And during that time, he gave us a nickname. He nicknamed, it was a nickname for our marriage, actually. He nicknamed us Sparky. It's supposed to be iron as one man sharpens another, not as your husband and wife sharpen each other. So he nicknamed us Sparky. Why? Because we were always at it. Always at it. I mean, okay, we never cussed at each other in our marriage. We've never thrown at each other. We've never cheated on each other. But we have yelled loudly. <laughs> we have had complete obstinance for weeks at a time where we didn't want to speak to each other. We've had a lot of craziness. And we both almost got to the point where we were going to cheat. Because that's how far you can get. Because you're going to cast your anxiety somewhere. And it'll either be on God or it'll definitely be part of it on your spouse. And so, we've got to enjoy one another. Let me tell you, if you're married, don't be like Tracy and I at our younger years, where we did not enjoy our time together. You're supposed to be enjoying the life of your youth. You're supposed to be just having a blast together. There's plenty of other people to do discipling. You don't have to disciple every little thing. You don't have to correct every little thing. Now, you know, husbands, you are your wife's primary disciple. You are in charge to get her to heaven. And if what you're saying isn't working, then find out something else that does so that you can enjoy one another. Today, we start our campaign. Our campaign to come and enjoy our relationship with God. To go and enjoy bearing fruit together, changing our city, and enjoy all the incredible relationships that God has blessed with us. Let's go out two by two, coming and going. Let's enjoy our special missions today. Let's